Hey everyone, I'm Pauline from the blog richfinancialindependence.com and when I'm not spending all my money biking around Europe, I'm stacking Benjamins in Guatemala. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, money nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we're kicking off another glorious weekend in Texarkana with an epic roundtable discussion about, of all things, money. Joining us today from the classic site, LenPenzo.com, Bruce Springsteen. Bruce! No, I'm sorry, it's not Bruce. He had to run. It's really just good old Lynn Penzo. And from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. Rounding out today's trio of greatness, the author of Control Your Cash, Greg McFarland. Joe, when are we getting rid of this dude? And here he is, the guy who says he has a plan for this whole thing but won't show anybody, Joe Saul Siha. Completely complimentary podcast coming your way. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Can't believe that you don't have to pay for this, huh? The best things in life, as mom said, are free. Hey, guess what? Got a fantastic show to finish out this eight-week segment of shows and can't wait to get to it. But first, got to tell you that you should be excited to get to MagnifyMoney.com because when you head to StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money, you know what you'll find? you'll find that that checking account, that savings account, and those credit cards, consolidation loans, student loans, all that stuff isn't as good as it could be. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money should be the first place that you go when you're looking for better financial products. You comparison shop everything else. Why not compare these? You know, as we record this, the Fed a week ago just raised interest rates a quarter point. So let's see what that did to savings accounts. And by the way, They probably have changed again between the time that I'm recording this and the time that you listen. So you'll want to check back right away. But anyway, I just went to Magnify Money. Now I go to Savings Accounts, get personalized offers, and bam, we're there. See how quick that was? We're still sitting at 1.3%, guys, with the top two, Dollar Savings Direct and Bank Purely. Both get a grade of very transparent when it comes to their fine print. I love these fine print scores uh, because I don't want to have to dig in and wonder what the heck they're talking about. $1 minimum balance and a 1.3% rate on a savings account. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And you can comparison shop that easy on everything. All right. I'm excited about all of this stuff. I'm excited about this great round table. And I'm also excited about the middle because I think people don't think enough about their online presence and what that does to your ability to make money. You have to have a great online presence, not just getting rid of the bad stuff, but also setting yourself up with the good stuff that's available online. So let's get this party started, huh? All right, let's walk across the basement here and fire up my dad's shortwave again. And uh, let's see who we get on the line. Let's start off in Los Angeles, California, where the man himself, Len Penzo, from that crazily titled LenPenzo.com blog, is at. Is that Joe, that? how are you? I didn't know how to finish that sentence. Isn't that horrible? We've, no, that's okay. We've that's just okay. Been, Guess what? I, I've been busy. I, I've been studying for my dental exam, which is coming up in a few days. Oh, that's that's rough. Isn't that you rough? know what gets me is I'm one of those people that I can do anything I want in my teeth. I never get a cavity. I've never had a cavity in my life. Never, ever, and, uh, not one. I've never had one. And I don't, when I was younger, I never brushed my teeth. It was terrible, just terrible. And, and, and I still don't floss. I never floss, almost never. But I did learn when I was sitting in the chair, uh, you know, the hygienist would say, well, you're not flossing well. You're not flossing well. And I discovered that if you floss about three or four days before you go in, it's all it takes. And your gums are, it doesn't look great to the hygienist. She thinks you're doing a great job. Happens every time. Oh, you're, you're doing so well. You're doing so well. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, thanks a lot. But I'm only I'm only flossing three or four days before I go in. So that's something for you people who don't like to floss and you hate getting uh, beat up by your hygienist when you're in the chair. Just floss three or four days before the test. And I promise you there'll be no bleeding, no so nothing. So great, great, dude. We start off the podcast with how to lie to your dentist. 
Does it really matter what the hygienist thinks or that you actually have great uh, dental habits? Which one's more important? No, I'm, that, that, that's well, not like a, I said, it doesn't matter to me. That's not a me. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> who cares? Just my teeth. My teeth are good no matter what. Yes. A guy who I think has a full set of teeth. Definitely has a full head of hair in, in Las Vegas. It's uh, Mr. Greg McFarland from Control Your Cash. And for the 39th episode in a row, Joe does not go to me first. So, Len, do you floss only on the day three or four days before your cleaning or starting three or four days and then every day until the cleaning? About three or four days before the cleaning, unless unless I've had like corn on the cob or something somewhere in between the cleaning and the other cleaning. So, you know, if I've had corn on the cob and there's something in there I just can't get out, yeah, then I'll then I'll floss <laughs> just to get it out, just to get the stuff out. But just between the teeth where the stuff is. <laughs> next time next time I see you in person, we're only shaking hands. We are not <laughs> Greg, I brush my teeth at least two times, at least two times a day, sometimes more. Greg, you just had the back of your throat floss today, didn't you? Oh, man. I had my first endoscopy. Congratulations. Boy, this, this is a fun age to get to. <laughs> um, yeah. It, for anybody out there who is hesitant of getting an endoscopy, if you've gone to your gastroenterologist and they recommend this and you put it off for five weeks in a cowardly fashion like I did, you don't have to. I didn't feel a thing. Fantastic. I literally did not feel a thing. Fantastic. And the drugs were good. You enjoyed it? The drugs were good and fast acting, and they said don't operate any heavy machinery for 24 hours afterward, and a vehicle counts as heavy machinery, and I did not drive back, but I think I probably could. If I'm not on the show next week, you'll know why. <laughs> right, right. And across town from you, I think we have uh, Paula Pant from Afford Anything. I am totally on the line. What's happening, Paula? Not a whole lot to report. I have not been to the dentist or the doctor in quite a while, so uh, no horror stories to share there. No bleeding gums or uh, anything else of that nature. That's so good. This is a train wreck already. But the good news is, Paula, we got the band back together. Where does that expression come from? Was there once a particular band that broke up and then got back together? And you have, that was... you have no idea the expression, we're getting the band back together. Mm, no, like I, I assume there was a band. I guess there was and a band. It there was got a, back together. There was a band. Yes, there there definitely was a band. Greg, we're getting the band back together. To me, it's one of those expressions that I thought was just so time tested. It didn't even have an origin. I thought it was the Blues Brothers. Wasn't the Blues Brothers that went around oh, saying we're getting the band back yeah, together? I, I think that's it. I thought that's I thought that's what it was. I thought we got Paula, but apparently I stumped the entire panel. <laughs> That's cool. I am not uniquely out of the loop. She's like, woohoo. Yeah, all right. This is starting off rough. So why don't we just jump in, guys? Let's get to the fun stuff. Let's talk about money. Our first uh, piece comes to us from Market Watch, and it's an opinion piece. It says, heed these seven investing rules as U.S. stocks hit record highs. And Greg, I'm coming to you first with this piece from Lance Roberts. What do you think about this first rule? He says, sell losers fast and let winners run. Typing get the band back together into Google auto completes Blues Brothers. So there you go. Bam. Yep, it is. I, I, they even have clips on YouTube. I'm looking at it too. <laughs> How about that? Didn't exist before 1980. Um, some of this advice, I think, is so basic it almost doesn't even count as observations. It's as natural as breathing. But sell losers fast, let winners run. Yeah, it makes sense in theory. But uh, the tricky part and the reason why we're not all rich is because – how do you define a loser? How do you define something that is permanently never going to return your investment as opposed to something that is just temporarily out of commission? How do you do, how do you define a winner? How do you know that that stock that's gone up 30 percent in the last month is still going to be worth holding on to a year from now? That's what I wondered. How do you define a loser, Greg? A change in management? Eh, if I'm seeing quarter after quarter of negative returns, if I'm seeing a, a company that that is not making money and has no hope to and doesn't have to rely on a cash infusion from the government. Like I, I was going to say Tesla Motors would fit would fit into that category, but it appears that regardless of who's in the White House, Elon Musk is going to enjoy an infusion until he eventually sells enough cars to turn a profit. But there are, there are other, I mean, just off the top of my head, Faraday Future is another company that draws nominal revenue figures, tons and tons of expenses, huge losses. And I mean, that to me is the definition of a loser, something that I can't foresee any real world scenario in which a company's fortunes are ever going to turn around, regardless of the, the Faraday future CEO, who, by the way, has 
<laughs> here's another red flag. The company doesn't even disclose his name. I'm not kidding. He could leave. You could bring in Warren Buffett. You could bring in Steve Ballmer. I think that company's beyond help. That, that to me, is the definition of a loser. What about a company like Amazon, which has always had good sales coming in the front door, but also really struggled to make a profit? Well, if you ask its CEO, he'll say that we've it's never been about turning a profit since when was it founded? 1994, 1995. It's about it's about creating market share, and to the point now where they've they've dominated. I mean, you, you used to think of Walmart as the huge monopolistic retailer. Well, you don't really think that way anymore. Plus, Amazon has had some positive quarters, and it is duration. I mean, the company has succeeded for 22 years. It's not going anywhere. Len, sell your losers fast, let winners run. Like Greg says, sounds good. What do you when you've got a loser investment? How do you define that? This is a, a hard one because sometimes you'll think you have a loser. I, I don't know what the definition of loser is unless you're actually like looking at the bottom line and seeing like like Greg said, there's returns or not. You know, it, it almost requires hindsight to meet up with this because sometimes you would have sworn that. Uh, if you were just looking at the returns, Amazon was going to be a big loser early on, and only now they've just started turning, send, getting positive returns, maybe about the last year or so. But up until then, they were losing money constantly. So I don't know how you determine what a loser is. I guess if something is dropping continuously and you're holding it and holding it and it keeps losing money and it's not showing – if you're looking at the underlying fundamentals and you cannot justify – sticking with that stock, I guess that's a loser. But it's really hard to, I mean, this kind of presupposes you know what a loser is in advance. It's kind of, it's almost unfair. This is an unfair term. It just means that you have some criteria, like Greg's talking about. You've got some criteria that defines what a loser is, right? Well, yeah, you, to me, okay, so okay. So now we're going back to the old exit. So here's what I do when I buy an individual stock. I have an exit strategy, and I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but it, if you have an exit strategy, these things are easy to, de to define, right? So I'm going to buy stock X, and if it drops 15%, or 10%, I'm going to sell it no matter what. And if it makes 20% or 50%, I'm going to sell it no matter what. If you have that exit strategy when you buy the stock ahead of time, this kind of sell losers, let winners, that's how you would define it. That's my best answer. Paul, if you had an exit strategy, you would have been off this podcast a long time ago, I'm sure. <laughs> I know, right? If I had an exit strategy, I would be like... <laughs> It's like, what the hell? I would have dropped I... this puppy like a hot potato. <laughs> what am I doing here? Right. What's your exit strategy with individual stocks and selling your losers fast? I don't really have one. And I mean, partially that's because I don't really play the individual stock game. As we talked about in one of the last podcasts, I have two individual stocks that I hold, both of which are like a tiny, tiny portion of my portfolio. Joe, you and I, uh, I, talked, I told you earlier today that I consider that money that I could otherwise throw into a dumpster fire. <laughs> Right. I really don't play the individual stock game enough to have an exit strategy. What I would say is twofold. Number one, if I'm buying an individual stock, it's because I believe in its long-term viability. I'm a big fan of that quote from Philip Fisher, who said uh, the best holding period is forever. So if I buy an individual stock, it's with the same mindset that I have when I buy an index fund, which is barring any type of substantial change in the company's activities, like a change in the market, a change in the industry, barring some kind of actual real change. If I'm buying a company, it's because I want to be a part owner of that company, not just a trader. Does this, does this same, uh, I don't know, quote, sell losers fast, let winners run apply if you have a portfolio of real estate? Oh, God, real estate, I would be even more reluctant to sell because there are such high transaction costs. You know, you can sell a stock fee free on certain platforms with real estate every time. I mean, from the moment you buy a house to the moment you sell it, that house has to appreciate 6% plus inflation just for you to break even on the commissions, not to mention all of the other trading costs. So um, real yeah. estate is, is something you definitely want to consider an illiquid asset and not trade often Got unless it. you're in the business of flipping, but then that's a completely different business yeah, altogether. That's right. a, it's just a, it's a different model. Greg, buy cheap and sell expensive is his next piece of advice. I guess this is, is he talking about the PE ratio? I think so. But then when you actually get into the meat of it, he says, uh, however, you will pay any price for a stock because someone on television told you to, whether it's <laughs> Jim Cramer or somebody screaming at you from uh, Fox business or CNBC or whatever. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think that, 
just because somebody is touting something that it really makes an appreciable difference to the number of people going into the market and purchasing said stock. Well, you, we've we've seen the Kramer effect, though. I mean, he in particular does affect the price of a stock. Still, though, this yeah, many years yeah, in. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Probably not as much now as he's, as as you see. That's true. But that actually brings up another point, Greg. Uh, point number five on here is turn off the television. How much do you look to people on TV when you're when you're looking for your next potential purchase? Well, I, I say this over and over again. I mean, I usually keep Fox Business on during the day just to have another voice in the house, whether it's disembodied or whatever. Yeah. And routinely, I mean, when Liz Clayman after the closing bell and she'll say, uh, yeah, the market was down 0.13 percent today. <laughs> and that and that's 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 the opening story. That is the most important thing that happened in the market at large is that it lost one eight hundredth of its value, which it's probably going to regain most of the following day. So, yeah, if you're looking at broadcast television to tell you the inner workings of the th think about it. I mean, that's cable channels that are available to millions of other people. You're not going to find any hot tips there because it's already passed through other sets of hands and is hitting everybody at the same time. If it's for entertainment purposes, that's great. But there's absolutely no reason to pay attention to the movements in the market for more than monthly if you're trying if you're trying to if you're trying to gauge anything without driving yourself crazy yeah number seven on here is go against the herd and i hear what you're saying it's hard to go against the herd when you're listening to the place that everybody else <laughs> is listening to number three on here len i really appreciate this time is never different he says as much as our emotions and psychological makeup want to always hope and pray for the best this time is never different than the past do you agree with that because you seem to be a guy who thinks that there's another shoe that's about to drop that maybe hasn't dropped in a long, long time. Well, yeah, and that's, again, that's that's an example of this time is never different. There's been lots of shoes that have dropped over the past, uh, what, what? I mean, you just go back. I'll, I'll only go back to 1987. You had a big crash in 87, right? And then you had a big run up to uh, the dot-com bubble in uh what is that, 1999, 2000? And then we had another, you know, stocks fell and things ran up again until 2007, 2008. There was another drop. So things go in cycles. Nothing ever changes. You know, that's just the way it is. And irrational exuberance, you'll have a lot of people trying to justify that, no, this time is different, but it's really not. Things go in cycles. That's how it is. All, all the way back from the beginning of time, uh, that's how things are. Can I bring up one thing that's not on here that I'm surprised this guy did not put on here for stock market? Don't fight the trend. Don't fight the trend, which is I've been famous for doing now for the past uh, five years, and it's <laughs> killed me. Right. Uh, seriously. But that is one of the biggest stock market investing tips there is. If something's going up long term, you look at the trend and you tend to stick with that until it turns. That's usually pretty good advice. You know, unfortunately, I didn't have him followed it. But well, it's funny you say that. And I want to go back to you, Greg, because of the three people on this panel do more individual stock investing. You know, when he says don't fight the trend, Len says that, that, uh, you know, you're looking at what we call a top down strategy, right? Where you look at the overall trend and then look at stocks that fit that versus a bottom up where you find a stock that you like and then you make sure that the trend is agreeing with uh, this particular stock and that this stock doesn't have to be a salmon. Which way do you invest? Do you start off with a trend like you like, you know, water or you like wrestling or whatever it might be? Or do you start off with a stock and then work backwards? You say I like wrestling. You, you you make it sound like I have posters of gold dust and the Undertaker I on my don't. wall, like a twelve year old. I make, <laughs> I I'm I am a casual fan. I went to WrestleMania a couple of years ago with my girlfriend, and she was upset that I was not wearing a WWE T shirt. Was I she really wearing something some pla some plain solid color? Really? She's like, yeah. Wow. I've been to one too. I've I, I've bought tickets to see those. They're fun. They're so fun. Okay, I should have yeah. said cats. I should have said cats. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Um, top down. I don't think, hey, this is this is the new hot sector. Let's dig a little deeper into it. It's really more a case of just plowing through financial statements, which is which is not a lot of fun. It's yeah. it's tedious unless you have a particular desire for it. And I have to admit that I don't. To me, it's more of an eat your vegetables kind of thing. But the reward is there. Yeah. And, and I have to I have to hit on the author for this time is never different. Well, maybe it is. I mean, yeah, 1999, 2000, back when Paula was learning to walk, that time was plenty different. <laughs> <laughs> As Len pointed out, Pets.com was trading at thousands of times earnings, and a bubble like that might not be historically unique in the sense of it'll happen once ever, but it's infrequent enough that it'll happen only 
three or four times in a person's investing lifetime, as will the uh, nadir that we saw in the stock market of 2009, 2010, when everything is underpriced. Uh, that's an interesting point, and I think we're going to leave it right there. And we're going to move on to a piece in Kiplinger that I found interesting. This is a banking piece by Lisa Gerstner that says, six things you need to know about paying with cash. And I'm really, guys, I'm not that interested in in the points in the article. My my main thing was more just about paying with cash. Paula, do you pay with cash? Almost never. How come? Uh, I like, number one, being able to get the rewards, mostly frequent flyer miles that come through my credit card. Number two, I like being able to have a third party who can be the intermediary if there are any disputes that I have with the merchant in terms of the product or the service or, you know, if, if there's any type of merchant dispute. And number three, I don't like carrying large sums of cash around or, or really any sums of cash around above like 20 bucks because I'm more likely to lose cash. If I lose my wallet, I can cancel the credit cards. The cash is gone. You're saying the risk of cash is far greater than the reward. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Len, do you pay cash or just uh, gold bullion? <laughs> well, I, I pay cash for, for, this might sound strange, but if I'm doing business with somebody who I don't really trust because it's happened before or I've given a credit card to somebody and they've taken my credit card number and used it for their own, you know, gain. So if I don't trust the person I'm dealing with in to that regard, I will use cash. I keep cash around always for tips. Nothing worse than not having money to tip somebody for whatever reason. But no, I'm like Paula, generally speaking, I use the credit cards because the rewards are so great. <laughs> you can't beat it. But it's weird. If you don't trust somebody, it seems like you'd be more likely to use credit. I mean, I hear what you're saying about them stealing your credit. Let me give you an or... example. Pizza. Okay. Pizza. There, there are some pizza places, they will take your credit card, you know, right over the phone or what have you. And um, I'm not willing to do that some, for a lot of places. I'll, I'd will i rather say, nope, uh, have the guy come to my door and I'll pay him cash. So it's I'm not saying that's always, but that's just, that's the first example that comes right off the top of my head. Interesting. Craig, how about you? Cash or credit? Uh, I pay with cash as little as possible. I will buy a magazine with a credit card. If the retailer wants to pay a service fee while I earn another couple of Hilton Honors points, that's fine by me. I'm amazed that 40% of transactions are still via cash. Yeah, me too. The, yeah, the underground giant panda market is bigger than I expected. <laughs> Granted, that's from a year and a half ago, this article, but still. Uh, I prefer, like Paula said, having the credit card companies list and itemize my purchases, something I couldn't be bothered to do if I used cash for everything. Two exceptions, two places where I will pay cash. Number one, if I am traveling in a third world country, I've had a credit card number stolen once, never again. And depending how far into the hinterlands you go, You'll find countries where American dollars are pretty much accepted as legal tender, which is kind of convenient for living in this country. The other exception, I will carry cash on hand when I'm going out to dinner with a large group of people. This is a variation on what Len said about tips. I don't drink alcohol and I'm not going to order an appetizer for the most part, not because I'm cheap, just because that's the caloric intake that I need. And if I'm going to dinner with 10 other people and the bill comes out and they expect me to pay exactly one tenth of it when in reality I contributed more like 5% to the total cost, then yeah, I'm more than happy to just whip out cash. People think that it's somehow tactless and I've never understood why this is to calculate. All right. I paid 1895 for my entree, three bucks for my drink. That's 2195. Let's put 20, let's put a 20% tip on that. That's $4 and 40 cents. So now we're looking at about 2650 and then to pull out $26 and 50 cents in cash, put it in the middle of the table and say, Hey, I'm done. You guys figure it out. I don't think that's tactless. And I have been in groups where people seem to, you know, frown upon that. Paula, what do you think of that? I totally agree with what both Len and Greg said. I do carry cash around for tips. In fact, I, this one time I went to the bank and uh, because I like to have a bunch of ones and fives on me for the sake of tipping, especially because there's a lot of times when you need to tip somebody like a valet $2, you know, so I go to the bank and I asked the teller, I was like, hey, can I have $100 worth of ones? And he just looks at me and he's like, strip club? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but what about splitting the bill? What about splitting, uh, you know, Greg said, you know, hey, I figure out my part and I put my 2650 down. Instead of splitting it evenly, I'm just, yeah. does that sound tactless to you? 
No, if it's just myself and one or two other friends, if it's a small group, I'll just throw down a credit card. If it's a large group, I'll usually pay in cash just so the server doesn't have to run eight different cards. Yeah, yeah. You know, I figure it'll just be easier for them. So I calculate my percentage. I, w- I won't calculate it down to the penny, but if it's 2650, I might round up to 30, throw that in there and then let them figure out the rest. I was starting with the assumption that the nine other people at the party and myself are not all asking for separate checks. Right. The, to me, that is tactlessness. Mm-hmm. If I was at a table where somebody said that, uh, separate checks for everyone, please, I would look at the server and say, I completely apologize. That came out of someone else's mouth, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know how sometimes the server will give you one check and then the table hands back, like, here are eight cards. Could you please put $4 on this one, $6 on this one? You know, so it's it's one check, but the table tries to pay with, like, an entire catalog full of cards. Right. Yeah, and I think I think this is where the customer is always right, reaches its reaches its logical conclusion. And at that point, the, the server, the manager needs to put their foot down and said, all right, give me one card. And then the next time you people go out together, go to the next person in line, figure it out yourselves. I want to ask one more question about cash here, which is, uh, I do, you know, we don't deal in conspiracy theories here, but let's do it now. There's this idea uh, that we've seen a little bit in, in Europe around uh, cashless societies and also ne- negative interest rates. And Paul, I think we'll stick with you here. Have you seen this? I am not really familiar with this. Okay, so uh, banks having negative interest rates, meaning governments want you to take your money out and spend it to keep the economy moving, right? Don't keep so much money in the bank. However, if we have a cashless society, you don't have the option of just putting it in, you know, Len Penzo's bunker. You, You have to either spend the money or pay a bank, one or the other. And it just... I keep hearing this conspiracy theory that as we go toward a cashless society, we're all kind of handcuffed to the system that we might not want to be a part of. Haven't heard anything of that. I always, I've always i heard people bounce around the phrase cashless society, but I thought that they were simply referring to the fact that we tend to use debit cards and credit cards more and we make payments electronically. No, I'm talking about that, making I didn't a- realize that people literally meant some type of conspiracy theory. Now, that just that sounds a little wacky to me. We, well, no, not conspiracy theory. We talk about cashless society. We talk about completely getting rid of cash and governments completely getting rid of it. Len, have you heard about this? Absolutely. I, I'm, a cashless society is a banker's dream. Why do bankers want a cashless society? They want a cashless society because a cashless society will prevent bank runs. If you get rid of all cash, banks will never have to ever worry about a bank run because they can close your account instantaneously and stop you from pulling. It's it's the ultimate in capital controls. So yes, a cashless society is very dangerous. And you probably knew I was going to say that, but but uh, yeah, that's what all banks want. And by the way, we have negative interest rates here in America. Remember, real negative, real interest rates, which is right. the nominal interest rate right. minus the inflation rate. Sure. We already have negative real interest rates here in America, whereas in Europe, they actually have nominal negative. Right. And then it's even worse with the inflation. Yeah. And nominal is what I'm talking about. If you combine cashless society with nominal negative interest rates, we've got yum yum for the bank, I think. Uh, yeah. uh, Greg, have you heard of this? Yes, and I think it's a sky is falling kind of thing. As long as politicians hire prostitutes, we will never, ever have a cashless society. (laughs) I think that's a great place to leave that one. Greg gets the last word on two of them in a row. Nice work. Hey, got to hit the pause button briefly here on our fantastic discussion with Greg, Paula, and Len to say a big thanks to everybody who's gone to magnifymoney.com because when you go to magnify money you know what you find out that when you use our link stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money first of all magnify money then knows that we sent you but second you can then compare and save and it's easy to ditch the bad stuff get in the new stuff the average person saves 450 dollars when it comes to savings and higher interest rates let's look at another thing how about if we look at 0% interest credit cards. I'm going to click on that link. I'm going to say that my credit score is not very good this time. I think last time I looked at good. Let's look at average, 600 to 679. And I'm using this card until month 24. And I'll update my results and bam, guess what it tells me? It says that the True West Visa Signature Card has very transparent an A rating when it comes to fine print. The APR uh, 8.65 to 9.65 variable. 
uh, the annual fee, zero, an ongoing fee, zero, annual fee. Their introductory offer is a 0% interest rate for 18 months for a balance transfer. So here's what you do. You transfer your balance there. You cut up the card. Now you've taken your debt for the next 18 months to a 0% rate. Uh, they're at 2.41, City Diamond Preferred, uh, 2.9 APR. And now these are overall, remember. So it's 8.65 to 9.65 when it comes to the overall interest rate. But remember, we're looking at 24 months. See how easy that was? StackyBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. If you're paying off debt, have to finance a car, although we prefer paying cash, change up your savings account or your checking account. Well, I'm excited about our FinTech Friday, and this is a little spin on FinTech. You know, when we talk about your online profiles, it's not really FinTech, but man, it is so affects your ability to make money. And HR managers now, they are instructed to look at everything that you do online. We've seen that a lot in media discussions, haven't we? A company named Brand Yourself serves that niche, and Patrick Ambron is the CEO. And we're going to talk to him about getting your act together online and just like we do every FinTech Friday, introduce you to a whole new company doing some work that you probably haven't heard about. Let's say hello to Patrick Ambron coming down to the basement. And Patrick Ambron joins us in the basement. Have a seat, man. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Well, absolutely. And I know that this is, this is a big time. My daughter just got her first job out of college. And I know there's lots of college kids who are now looking for jobs. And online matters more than ever now, it seems. You know, you're absolutely right. How you look online now directly impacts your career. There's two kind of facets to that. One, it just takes the simplest kind of negative thing that can happen to anybody to really hurt your career. And on the other end, if you don't have a strong positive online presence that, that does a good job of showcasing you, uh, you're losing opportunities to people who do. I, I think that's interesting because a lot of people just focus on erasing the bad stuff, but really you can paint yourself in a very positive light. Exactly. Erasing the bad stuff and monitoring for the potentially bad stuff is definitely step one. That's kind of the baseline. Uh, the reason there being Almost everybody has something online that could potentially damage them. It doesn't mean they're a bad person or, or irresponsible. From that standpoint, employers and, and all sorts of organizations are using more and more technology to dig deep. So that is step one. It's important. And it's kind of like the baseline of let's make sure you have nothing that's that we call a risk factor. I'm sure, Patrick, you've got some horror stories about some stuff that people had online that they probably shouldn't have had. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. And there is, there is a few stories in the news just this month that I think kind of show the wide range of the type of risk factors that can happen and how everybody's very vulnerable. Very recently, there was about 10 kids accepted in the Harvard that had their acceptance rescinded. And it was because of memes they were posting in a private Facebook chat. Uh, now, the, the content of these memes were very, very, very kind of distasteful and offensive. Obviously, they were meant to be jokes and uh, it's understood why those offers were rescinded. But a lot of people think it's that, you know, someone who's just completely irresponsible and not thinking right. But in the same month, you actually had a dean at Yale. So the other end, not a student, a dean at Yale get fired for what she was posting on Yelp. And it just goes to show that everything we do is recorded in any kind of lapse of um, judgment or, or something taken out of context could have such a big impact on your career. What kind and of if you're not. Go ahead. What kind of stuff can you post on Yelp? I'm wondering that would get you fired. In this case, the uh, perpetrator was, I, the best way to put it, being a bit classist. Uh, like when okay. she was reviewing restaurants and stuff, she was she came across as a uh, very, very, very uppity and, and looking down. And colleges in, in places like that already having that type of reputation. It just didn't bode well for her. I was reading off of uh, your site that, 69% of employers admit to have rejected college grads because of inappropriate social media posts. That's a big number. Yeah. I mean, if you look, and that number is increasing, here's what we know. Depending on which study you do, and they're all pretty close, it's 75% of companies are required to screen you online in some way, shape, or form now. And that's up from years ago, and it's increasing every year. And on top of that, they're starting to use and getting encouraged to use by uh, an organization called SHRM, which is kind of the central organization to, on hiring practices that that organization is supposed to follow. 
that they should be using third parties. So you've got companies that are helping them not only do it, but do it more effectively. And what they're getting good at finding is if there's anything that shows you might not be a good fit. And here's here's the reason why it's so important to an organization. From their standpoint, hiring the wrong person who's not a good culture fit or just isn't you know a, a stand up person is so expensive. You know that's quantifiable. When you hire someone, then have to fire them and replace them. And uh, there's ways these technologies help them pinpoint you wouldn't be a good fit or you you know all these things that you're not realizing are being associated with you. Maybe you didn't even post them yourself are out there and and the number of people disqualifying people to make your decision easier, being like, you know, this person, it seems like uh, they party too much or they made a joke about their old boss uh, and that's coming up as a flag as trashing an old employer. Meanwhile, you and I know that was based off the relationship you have with your old boss, that was a complete joke, but you just didn't realize it was being looked at that way. So yeah, more and more employers are doing it and more and more of them are using it to, to disqualify candidates to make their job easier. Well, let's talk about what you guys are doing at Brand Yourself because you have a thing, to put it technically, right, uh, called, yeah. called Student Makeover. Tell me about that. At the start, Brand Yourself has software and services that helps you do two things. The identifying cleanup risk factors, which could be anything from a bad photo to an ill-advised tweet to something showing up in Google because your ex wrote something bad about you and it's your number one result, and then has also tools that help you look better, clean those things up. And as we spoke about before, take additional steps to actually give yourself an edge and make sure that when you get looked up, you look like a real pro. Uh, and all of your skills and your awards and your experience and your projects are, are, are doing you a favor. Now, we've had that tool for a long time. We're always improving it. We've had 500,000 professionals that use the tool. But one thing we realized is that one of the groups of professionals that need it the most are using it the least. And that's kids going into college or college kids going into the workforce for the first time. And what we found is they really need it even, you know, just as much, if not more than their, you know, professionals already out in the workforce because they've amassed so much more content. Uh, there's so much stuff associated with them, but the reason they're not using it is because a, they don't you know, necessarily have a budget even at a hundred dollars a year and B they're just not educated in the way of realizing this stuff is being looked at in the same way they will in a few years. So what we've launched is a program where parents can actually purchase this on behalf of their uh, child. Think of it as a perfect graduation gift. Because what we have learned is that college kids will use a tool like this if they're, it's explained to them and it's, and it's free. So in this case, we said maybe we can have parents join in the process and say, look, you've got to clean yourself up online and you should really be doing some stuff to, to promote yourself online. And I bought you this tool set. That's kind of our way of saying this might be the best way to, to help students who, who aren't thinking about it otherwise. I know there's some people listening to this, and so do you, Patrick, who are thinking to themselves, yeah, well, you know, this sounds great. I'll just go and I can do this all manually. But let's talk about how your tool actually works. So let's dig in. If somebody goes to brand yourself and they're going to get the student makeover, tell me what they do. Glad to. It's good to know, first of all, it's half the products in charge of identifying and cleaning up risk factors. The other half is actually showing you things you can do that, that just make you look better and promoting yourself in the right places. Okay. But let's stick to that first half, cleaning it up. Like, why couldn't you do that manually? You absolutely could, but here's the risk in doing that. One, it takes a lot of time to go in. And like I said, you, a lot of people now have thousands and thousands of posts. Our average customer has two or 3,000 posts and even more photos that we have to go through. So one, it just takes a lot of time, and we what our software does is, is find those things immediately. Number two, a lot of times, and this is an even bigger risk, you may not realize what is actually hurting you when, when employers use their algorithms. What I mean by that, you might not realize that joke you made about binge watching Netflix you know, on your long day weekend got you flagged for something because it was related to work ethic. And what we've done is our technology has taken We've taken the best practices that Sherm encourages hiring managers to use on both what are bad flags and good flags. And we've used very sophisticated techniques, a lot of machine learning driven algorithmic ways of going in and, and going through your stuff and showing you what could potentially be a risk factor. Now, you can decide to delete them. You can decide to keep them. That's up to you. But why it's better, one, it's much faster. You're not going through and spending hours trying to look at every single thing you've ever been tagged in or wrote. Uh, two, 
we're, we're going to show you things that you may not realize you might have missed. Uh, and simply put, more and more employers are using technologies to do this. So you want to fight fire with fire, right? They're using things so they don't miss things. Like You want to be on the same exact playing field as them. Now, additionally, uh, we're also going through and showing you, listen, you should really have this profile or your LinkedIn is great, but you should make these changes to it. It'll make it look better. Plus, it'll make it show up higher in Google. And by the way, if you join this group or tweet in these places, you're going to look more professional or look more involved in your industries. It's much more holistic than just going and auditing yourself, which has its limits. Awesome. So I go to the site, walk people through the beginning of the site. How long does it take to set stuff up and uh, what do I actually do? Yep. So you sign up, you got your name. And the first thing it does is it scours the web and kind of gives you a score. Part of that score is the first thing we're showing you are it only takes 30 seconds to go through all of that after you after you set your account up and it and we show you things you should delete. It could be a Google result. It could be a, a bad Facebook post. And we show you what we think might be bad so you can take care of it. Uh, on the other end, then it gives you right right off the bat within 30 seconds, it shows you things you can do to improve your presence. That might be building a profile, tweaking a profile, building a personal website, tweaking a personal website, writing a blog post, and it just walks you through that. So depending on what time commitment, it gives you an action plan and it gives you kind of risk factors immediately. And then from there, it's dynamic. The more work you put into it, the more it's going to be able to tell you to do to improve things. Awesome. And how much does it cost? $100 a year. Awesome. And obviously at the end of the first year, um, why am I keeping it after that? Just to keep monitoring? Yeah, there's two elements. One is think of it as the insurance and monitoring. All it takes is one tagged photo or one person you fire to go gotcha. write something about you on the web. Uh, we'll be the first to let you know so you can take action, action on it right away. So there's monitoring. Uh, but again, I, I think the longer term value of the product is, you know, we talk a lot about these risk factors because that's, again, getting to the baseline. There's so many things that could derail your career. But the longer term value is is allowing you to do a few things every month and ongoingly that uh, make you look better and kind of help you build a strong brand. And when you consider the fact that the average professional now is going to be switching jobs every two to three years and that by 2020, 40% of professionals are going to be taking freelance clients on the side, uh, you're always going to be having to pitch yourself and promote yourself to your next employer or your next client. And the better you've looked online, the better amount of content you've amassed, the, the better your opportunities are. So the longer term value is also on having something that walks you through that process on a regular basis because you can always be improving. Awesome. And uh, if you're out walking the dog or if you're on your morning run or on the way to work, we got you covered. We'll have the link to brand yourself and uh, the student makeover at stackybenjamins.com. Patrick, thanks a lot for hanging out with us, man. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Here's something cool. Patrick also let me know about a free tool that they have. If you want to try doing it yourself when it comes to your online reputation, or at least you want to look at all of the things that there are that you need to do, it's brandyourself.com forward slash online dash reputation dash management. Brandyourself.com forward slash online dash reputation dash management. And that will take you directly to their guide on protecting your brand online. And we all are a brand, aren't we? love that idea. I don't think we think about ourselves as a brand enough when we're talking to people online. Some of the stuff I see people post is amazing. Also amazing is this discussion we're having with Greg, Len, and Paula. So let's get back to it. Let's move on to our third piece, which comes to us from rfdtv.com. Here's something. This is written by Andrew Hauser. Answers to kids' tough money questions. And I don't really care what they say. I want to ask you guys these tough money questions, all right? So, Len, let's start with you. Kid asks you, how much money do you make? What do you tell your kid? I tell my kid how much money I make. Do you really? <laughs> I certainly do. Yeah, my kids know how much I make. So, Absolutely. So, do you think that the kid really wants to know exactly? I mean, and don't you worry about the kid going to school and just telling all their friends? My dad. I really, makes... I really don't care. I, I've never understood the stigma of people knowing what, how much you make. If, if you choose, you know, to me, it's not a big deal. It's, it's, you know, your income's your income. So, to me, it's more. The only reason you might want to be embarrassed about it is, is if you're living beyond your means, and then people can say, oh, you you know, you only make this much, but you're living like a king. Now, that'd be something to be embarrassed about. But, you know, uh, if you live below your means, heck, I don't know what the stigma is. 
So and I've tried to teach that to my kids. It's just a number. You know, the real thing is, do you live with stay living within your means? And the actual number you make, it doesn't matter. Paul, a kid asks, kid asks you how much money you make. You're probably not giving them the exact number. Well, I mean, again, I'm speaking only in hypotheticals because I don't have any children. But if I was worried that the kid would, if I lived in, say, a small town where a lot of people knew me, and I was worried that the kid would, like, blab about it and, and all of a sudden the whole neighborhood knows, that would be my reason for wanting to not reveal a number. It, it wouldn't be for the sake of protecting the kid. It would just be for the sake of not letting that number get out generally. But to Len's point, if why does we, it matter? Why does it matter that it gets out? Because people often treat you differently depending on the ideas and assumptions that they hold about a person with a given amount of money. So if a person finds out that you have a lot of money, they might, for example, start expecting you to pick up the tab when you go out places, or maybe they'll ask you for a loan, or maybe, you know, like it, it changes the, the dynamic of the relationship a little bit. You know, for close relationships, sure, I'm fine with letting close, close friends and family, no, actually screw the family, just close friends. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm fine with letting them know my net worth, but I just, I don't want casual acquaintances knowing that because that can interfere with our dynamic, our social dynamic. Yeah. Uh, Greg, do you let them know or not? First of all, by the way, if you have a broad enough cable or satellite package, RFD TV is fantastic. Crop reports, shows about poultry, all in 480p with minimal production values. I'm serious. It, it, it's a great network. <laughs> but if I had kids, if a gigantic, overwhelming if, I would probably understate, yes, I would lie to my children, by a few percentage points, just knowing full well that the kids would share this with their friends at school, or more likely, the teachers would overhear it. And yeah, I would just, I wouldn't need the headache. I would be glad to trade honesty for a quieter life. You'd increase that number then, but you say two or 3%, you really mean like 50, don't you? You give the kids some huge number that they tell their teacher? Absolutely not. I would go in the opposite direction. I would lowball it. I would I would rather have people thinking I'm poor than thinking I'm rich. Uh, I like the other one. My dad, Greg, he's a bajillionaire. <laughs> hey, and remember, whatever the kids say at school, it's all hearsay. Nobody knows for sure. I mean, you're, you're being truthful to your kids, but nobody knows what your kids, you know, if they're telling the truth or what anyways, right? How about this question? Why can Emma's family afford to go on vacation, but Paula, we can't? That's that's a tough one to answer. But what I would say is that people spend based on their priorities. So it might be that Emma's family prioritizes going on, on vacation, but we have different priorities and we've decided to put our money there. So that way it doesn't sound like scarcity or lack. It sounds like a conscious decision that you've decided that you value X more than you value Y. Oh, Len, I bet you would do what Paula did, but you'd probably change it to be this way. Because this is what I do, Len. I would say, I'd say, well, Emma's family, they value vacations and we value actually having some money. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's the first thing I would I, I would give a, a series of answers. There's, there's lots of answers to this question, right? One of the answers is, hey, maybe Emma's family just has more money than we do. <laughs> or two, like you said, maybe they value vacations more than we value other things. And I would point out other things that we have purchased in lieu of of the vacation, the vacation being the opportunity cost of buying uh, for something else that we went for. So, or it could just be that, hey, we're saving for a vacation, but uh, we, we don't have enough money yet for that vacation. We're going to have to wait one more year. I was you know, like that one of these days, you know? Yeah. I was being uh, <laughs> passive aggressive, by the way. There's no way I'd say that. That's because Emma's family's <laughs> losers and they spend every dime they make. That's why I yeah, kid. Whatever. Oh, and you could say this. You could say, hey, who just, they might be, who says they could afford it? Maybe they're putting this all on the credit card. Seriously. Yeah, but I right? wouldn't say that because my kid's going to go back to school I wouldn't and says, either. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Yeah, right? my, but, my dad says your dad probably can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be horrible. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we can get Greg back in on this one. Greg, why can't we just buy that now? <laughs> um, God, again, this is just yet another reason why I could not be a parent. I would just say change the subject or I guess I couldn't smack them for something like that, but <laughs> I, I wish I had a definitive answer for that. No, I, I, I guess I could explain to them the concept of economics. I mean, there's scarcity. It's like Paula says, it's not afford everything to afford anything. Even uh, 
again, for the second time he comes up in the conversation today, but I assume that Warren Buffett told his kids there's a, there's a limit to what I can indulge you with. And yeah, my limit is going to be less than Warren Buffett's. And you can keep asking why and tugging at my shoulder and complaining if you're a boy or making puppy dog eyes if you're a girl. It's still not going to happen. And this is why I had a vasectomy. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. This whole article is birth control for you, isn't it, Craig? Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 this or a trip to Disneyland. Take your pick. <laughs> Uh, Len, your kids must have said this before. Why can't we just buy this now? They must have thrown a tantrum or two. Oh my God. I, I, if there's a kid out there who has not said that, I mean, you got to be kidding. I tell you what, when they say that, I just say because it's either because we don't have the money or you don't have the money. What is this we? You know, so if it's something more personal to them, it's because you don't have the money. If it's something bigger like a vacation, I usually say because we don't have the money or we've repri we have other priorities. It's really not hard. You know, you just have to put your foot down and not waver and not cave in. Paul, I'm going to go to you for this last one. You tell your hypothetical child that you don't have any money and they say, well, why can't you just use the credit card? Ah, you know, I actually heard a kid say something similar where uh, the, the mom said, oh, we don't have any money. And the kid said, well, why don't you just go to that machine and get some in reference to the ATM? That was a cool question, actually, because it, it like gave her the opportunity to talk about where that money actually comes from. You know, that money doesn't come from a plastic card, nor does it come from a machine. You know, she gets to explain the invisible process behind that that leads to the demonstration of the card or the machine. So, um, I, yeah, I thought that was really cool. It was, basically, it was just an opening segue into like, a, you know, a, like, mommy, where does money come from? Essentially sort of a question. Are you saying that you listen to a mother give the money birds and bees talk to her kid? I did. Yeah. Yeah. It was a family <laughs> friend. So I was there. We, I was at her house and it, we were all sitting around the dining table when this happened. When an ATM machine and a dollar love each other very much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. But 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 how do you how do you fit the two dollar fee into that analogy? The <laughs> ATM fee. <laughs> Is that the creepy part of the story? I don't know. I think that goes back to Greg's comment about how as long as politicians are buying prostitutes. Right. Exactly. All right. I think uh, that's a great place to end this. Uh, Mr. McFarland, where can people get that awesome book? Control your cash. Well, they could ask Len Penzo, but I'm sure he's not going to give up his copy. So they can buy it at Amazon.com. They can, they can download the Kindle edition. If you don't have a Kindle, buy a Kindle already. They're like 60 bucks uh, for $7. Or you can get a hard copy. And as you pointed out to me the other day, the hard copies run for about, I think it's upwards of $500. And those are ones I haven't even autographed. Yes, paperback from right now. Used from four hundred and forty eight dollars and twenty eight cents, there was one person selling one new for nine hundred and ninety nine dollars and eighty three cents. I'm going on Amazon right now. I'm going to put my copy up for ten thousand dollars, Greg. That is from a seller with a ninety six percent positive rating on thousands of transactions. <laughs> your your book has become a collector's item. That's what you're saying. Apparently, yeah, they can't they can't download copies of it fast enough. That is fantastic, Mr. Penzo. What's happening at LenPenzo.com? Hey, on LenPenzo.com, I share the story of what happens when you can't pay the restaurant bill. It's a true story where uh, I uh, it was time to pay my bill and I didn't have my money. So, so is this <laughs> is this a dine and dash story? No. Well, I I was considering it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I can't wait to read that one. That's fantastic, <laughs> Paula Pant. What's going on at Afford Anything? On the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with Jenny Blake. She is the author of the book Pivot, as well as the author of Life After College. And she talks about what to do if you want a career change. You're not happy with the job that you've got. You want to go somewhere else. You want to do something different. How do you facilitate that transition? And we also have an Ask Paula episode where uh, we chat about all kinds of questions that the listeners submitted. So tune into the Afford Anything podcast for that. Awesome. We'll have links to all that phenomenal stuff in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Guys, thanks for playing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, that's going to do it for this week. And guess what? It's also going to do it for this eight weeks of shows. For those of you new to the podcast, 
we take a break after every eight weeks. What we found was before we started taking a break, we would find ourselves posting shows later. The guests weren't as good anymore. And we like having a fresh show with guests that surprise you and are new and are fun and are ideas that you might not have thought of. And we really think a lot about that topic. And I'm going to tell you a little more about that in just a second. And we're also going to talk about what's happening during our off week and uh, when we come back from our break. So I've got a lot of news for you in just a second. But first, I got to say thanks to everybody. You know, I know that people try to use our sponsors to help out the show, but often you can't. There's You've already gone to Magnify Money or you're already using M1 Finance or you're just happy where you are and those don't fit. That's all fine. If you shop at Amazon, you can also help us that way by just using a few more keystrokes, stackybedjamins.com forward slash Amazon. You know what that does? It takes you right to Amazon, but Amazon then knows that we sent you and they send us a little thank you for sending you their way. So thanks to everybody who's done that, stackybedjamins.com forward slash Amazon. All right, let's talk about what's going to happen the next eight weeks and actually during our off week. OG and I take off uh, the next week, but we play some of our favorite episodes from the past. And man, do we have a good week next week. On Monday, Juggling Money, Family, and Work. This was a great episode from last summer that we did with uh, Kimberly Palmer, who has a great book on that topic. And I know that all of us are juggling a lot of different stuff. And Kimberly addresses a lot of the issues when you're juggling multiple things at work. So we decided to replay that episode. On Wednesday, Dr. John Cotter is probably the foremost guy at leadership. And whether you're working for the man or you are the man at work or you're a mid-level manager, we all need to understand leadership and how people work together. Even if it's just in your community, you need to know. And so uh, Dr. John Cotter and Dr. Holger Rathgaber come on the show and we talk to them about leadership lessons. And if you missed that, that was also last summer. Fantastic episode there. And then on Friday, a roundtable from two years ago that we really like. A lot of people think that they're great stock pickers. And one one person who, and this comes back from way before he was running for president, Donald Trump was talking about picking stocks. And this is not, you know, we don't do politics on the show. And definitely, if you're going into a roundtable show, you know, we talk about a lot of different stuff. But one of those topics was, is Donald Trump a good stock picker? And so uh, Thias Shefchik joined us for this roundtable. So you're going to enjoy it. We had a lot of fun. Uh, once again, no politics on the, on the Friday show. We just talk about people's ability to pick uh, individual stocks. And like every Friday, like this week, you get uh, quite a potpourri on that episode. Then when we return, we're kicking it off Fourth of July weekend. The Mad Fientist joins us to kick off the next eight weeks of shows. And I know that people absolutely love what Brandon does over at the Mad Fientist. He also has a fantastic podcast of his own, the Mad Fientist podcast. And uh, Brandon and I are going to talk about the basics of the FIRE movement, which for those of you that don't know what FIRE means, it's financial independence, retire early. So if you're interested in aggressive retirement planning or just planning at all, Brandon is a pretty analytical guy who is also very entertaining and we're happy he's kicking off the next eight weeks. And then Wednesday of that week, we've got him, the director of the brand new movie, The House, starring Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler. Of course, we're talking about Andrew J. Cohen. One of his last movies was Neighbors and Neighbors 2. We're going to have a ton of fun talking to him about a family that uh, forgets to save money for college and then is forced to do some stuff. We're going to ask him if that's autobiographical. So we're kicking the next eight weeks off with a lot of fun, and I'm super excited. So have a fantastic week with Griffin the Intern back here next week, listening to some of our best episodes in the past. We'll see you all in two weeks. Oh, I almost forgot one thing, and that is the game. I gave you the last clue for the game today. The number of people guessing the game has gone from a ton four weeks ago to nearly nobody. And I can't believe nobody's got it. I think people are overthinking it. The game is way, 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 way easy. And because it's the last day of the eight weeks, I'm going to tell you what the game is since nobody has it. Ready? It's the first word or two words that I say every episode starting seven episodes ago. So it's put those seven pieces together 
and you're going to come up with the clue. So, uh, man, your name's going in a hat. I know we're going to have a lot of people's names in the hat now, but heck, nobody's going to get it. Let's open it up to a lot of people. That's how easy the game was. And uh, people that sent me early answers, they had it. They were on that stuff. They just made a guess that was not it. And I think if you just go back and listen to them all now, you'll get where I'm going. And it's much simpler than people thought. All right. Go stack some Benjamins, everybody. Bye-bye. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com. Greg McFarlane appears courtesy of Control Your Cash. And special thanks to Len Penzo from LenPenzo.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Oh my God, was that fun. Greg, thanks a ton. Thank you. I got to run. Yep. See ya. Bye. <laughs> he actually said goodbye this time. Yeah. <laughs> What's up first. with that? Yeah, you... <laughs> what the hell's going on there?